Hello, my name is Tim Jan. I'm the pastor here at Advent Lutheran Church in Lake Ann. I'm here to share with you our preaching text and our gospel message for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, August 8th, 2021. Let's pray. Lord God, in making us one body, you connect us to each other's joy and suffering. Help us to give honor to every member, especially the forgotten and disrespected, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're continuing on with our sermon series. This is the third part of five on the body of Christ. A reading from 1 Corinthians. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the greater members, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all are honored together together with it. All rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, then teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a yet more excellent way. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. By Gryffindor, the bravest were prized beyond the rest. For Ravenclaw, the cleverest would always be the best. For Hufflepuff, hard workers were most worthy of admission, and power-hungry Slytherin loved those of great ambition. While still alive, they did, did divide their favorites from the throng. Yet how to pick the worthy ones when they were dead and gone? T'was Gryffindor who found the way. He whipped me off his head. The founders put some brains in me so I could choose instead. Now slip me snug among your, uh, around your ears. I've never yet been wrong. I'll have a look inside your mind and tell where you belong. This is a quote, of course, from the sorting hat in Harry Potter in the Sorcerer's Stone, the hat that picks which Hogwarts house each child is supposed to be sorted into. It's where they would spend their days and where they would uh, kind of be their crew in the school. Now, the hat itself, we know, is fictional, but there are a hundred online quizzes, including the official Pottermore quiz, 
that can sort you into which Hogwarts house you belong in. You know, humans are natural sorters. We love organizing and grouping, especially when it comes to people. Whether it's the Myers-Briggs personality inventory or the Enneagram or you got Zodiac signs or even online quizzes. I'm an Obi-Wan Kenobi in the Star Wars quiz, by the way. I'm proud of that. We flock to anything that's going to help us answer the question, who am I and where do I fit in? Who am I and where do I fit in? They're not all scientific, of course. We'll find some things more satisfying than others. Maybe there's a test out there to find out which personality test best fits your personality. But They're all about understanding ourselves and others, knowing our purpose. I still remember my feeling of dread in high school when we took this big, long career test, and I wasn't sure of some of my answers, and sure enough, they started passing out the envelopes, and all these other kids had these wonderful, clear career paths set before them, and mine said, inconclusive. They didn't, give, they didn't even give me an answer. Just what a quirky, insecure kid needs. Inconclusive. In the end, though, no matter how much we think we know ourselves and others, the only one who can really answer this question for us, who am I and where do I fit in, is God. Regardless, we Still, that doesn't still mean we we can't argue about it, and we do. And that's exactly what the first the the Corinthian Christians are doing in the first Corinthians, the book that we were reading. Paul is writing to the church that he founded, and they're deeply divided. And it's not about the type of stuff we fight about today, really. It's not about a budget, or it's not about bylaws, or about what to serve at coffee hour, but they're fighting about spiritual gifts. They're fighting about these special skills that come only from God. These skills that you can't just take up like a hobby or earn like a degree, but that come from God without our asking. And they're intended for the common good. And they find a way to just disagree and fight about them. Prophecy, teaching, knowledge, wisdom, faith, healing, tongues. There are a bunch of these spiritual gifts, and these are only uh, part of the ones that Paul names in Scripture. But the Corinthians disagree on which ones are the most useful. To Paul, that's kind of like trying to rank your body parts. Do you need an eye more or an ear? Well, both. Would you rather lose your right thumb or your left thumb? Well, neither, if that's all the same to you. You can't hear with your eyes. You can't smell with your ears. You need it all. So does Jesus. So does the body of Christ. The body is supposed to have all sorts of different kinds of parts. That's how God designed us. That's the only possible way that any of this thing called church will work. And you have to understand, in the early days, there wasn't just another body of Christ down the block that you could join if things didn't work out here. Yes, they were connected with other communities of believers in other cities and other parts of the world. But if you were a believer in Corinth, this was your body. And if you felt out of place with that, it wasn't God's mistake. It was either my mistake or the community's mistake. We've taken way too many, too much of our consumer culture, our cultural, uh, our, excuse me, our culture of a million choices into our understanding of faith. If one church isn't giving me a satisfactory religious product, well, I can move on. Whatever that means to me, i got to have that product. If one church that I'm part of isn't giving me the perfect outlet for my gift in a fully formed ministry that's already there, then I move on. 
seeing ourselves as free agents, individual souls, making temporary connections and then breaking them off whenever we feel like it makes that really it makes it really hard to build up the body of Christ. And it's even harder to build up our own spiritual maturity and wisdom. It's hard to get to know yourself if you keep on starting over from scratch. Losing an ear is really bad news for the body, but it's even worse news for the ear. Losing a, she- a sheep of the flock, like in the parable of the shepherd looking for the one sheep, that's bad news for the flock, but it's really, really bad news for the sheep. There's a reason, Paul, that never writes about spiritual gifts without writing about also about the body of Christ. And the reason there's a reason why Paul never writes about the body of Christ without writing about spiritual gifts. And the reason is we are supposed to be different, but we're also supposed to be together. We're supposed to learn our uniqueness, and we're also support to, supposed to support and value the uniqueness of others. There's an African word from the Zulu language, Ubuntu. It's the sense of a community, of being interconnected and interdependent. Nelson Mandela wrote that it is the profound sense that we are human only through the humanity of others. That if we are to accomplish anything in this world, it will be in equal measure due to the work and achievements of others. Ubuntu means that I am who I am only in relationship with you. This brings out an important point, and it's one that should be obvious, but I think we need to say it. Jesus wants unity, not just among Christians, but among all humanity. That is the end time goal that God will be our all in all, and that war and mourning and crying and pain will be no more because humanity is united. So the body of Christ is not an exclusive club that sets the city limits for our compassion. The body of Christ instead is a training ground. We practice here. We practice loving each other. We practice affirming each other's gifts. Because if we can't do that among others who are already in love with Jesus just like we are, how can we hope to do it for those even more different from ourselves? If I can't show the love of God for my siblings in Christ, what hope do I have of loving my Muslim neighbor, my atheist neighbor, my homeless neighbor, my addicted neighbor, my trans neighbor, my veteran neighbor. Last week, I said that God uses the cross to overcome divisions. What God uses to overcome our egos and our individualism is love. Even though this reading today that I just read for you is rather long, it's still only half the story, and I think we need to finish it. Whether you're a Gryffindor, a Hufflepuff, a Ravenclaw, or a Slytherin, whether you're an INFP or an ESTJ, whether you're a 4 or a 9 or a 1, whether you're a Pisces, a Sagittarius, a Qui-Gon Jinn, or an Obi-Wan Kenobi, I invite you to hear these words from God Hear them speak to you in your uniqueness and yet draw you into the body in your interconnectedness. Because in proper context, these words I'm about to read were not written from a young, for a young newlywed couple who had freely chosen each other out of all the men and women available in the entire world, but rather with a struggling community whom God had chosen to be together. A grizzled church that are at this point are pretty much sick of the sight of each other. Struggling for a way to put pride aside and to find a new path forward together. Paul writes, Are all apostles? 
Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain Nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I see only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, But the greatest of these is love. Amen.